Yes. I think I uh, told you already uh, something about um, what I'm going to talk about. And I will recapitulate only shortly what uh, Michael or, uh, already said, namely that uh, the multiple, uh, multiple sclerosis is not fully understood. I'm not the one who should tell it in the first place, but at least as a biophysicist, I understood it from uh, the physicians and from the biologists, and it's quite clear that uh, this disease is a multifactorial disease, a demyelinating disease, with all the cells that we <coughs> under uh, derived that are highly investigated, somehow involved. Of course, the uh, the autoreactive CD4 uh, T cells and uh, attracting the macrophages to the central nervous system, but also, and we know this quite good in our institute, uh, with a certain um, and not neglectable uh, contribution of B lymphocytes, either B cells or plasma cells. And I think I'm right to tell that the main problem uh, why the people are suffering is not the fact that uh, there are immune infiltrates in their brain, but uh, because that, uh, the neurons are dying, and this is leading to long-term disability at the end. And what's quite important, and what's important uh, in order to choose the right method to understand what's the pathophysiology uh, and the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis is that we have a certain time course. And at the beginning, at this clinical, uh, when the people have this clinically isolated uh, uh, syndrome, you don't know if they will develop an MS or not. So actually, you don't know if they have MS or not. And first, in the later uh, phases, when uh, they are developing this uh, relapsing remitting, um, maybe they are developing this relapsing remitting uh, course where the neuroinflammation plays an important role. They are saying uh, it turns out, okay, it is MS. And at the later stages, where as far as I know, Michael, please correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, there is no uh, real good uh, therapy at, um, in this secondary progressive phase of uh, DMS and where the neuron degeneration that we have heard before is uh, really important. And actually, in order to understand how MS works, act uh, actually, we need to have techniques which are really uh, capturing this time course. And now I'm coming uh, to the other point which is really interesting for us. Um, we cannot uh, investigate all the aspects that we want to investigate in, investigate in humans and this is why we uh, are using and um, mouse models, murine models, rodent models, and even if I know it's, uh, they are not really good models, uh, perfect models, and they are not resembling the whole uh, disease, the um, I don't know, whole course and the whole aspects of multiple sclerosis, uh, they are really important. And uh, uh, this is what uh, I will talk about. I will talk uh, about imaging in mice having uh, different kinds. I just uh, enumerate here uh, a few um, uh, um, of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which each of these models are resembling certain aspects of what has been observed in um, humans in uh, multiple sclerosis. For instance, uh, what we can really uh, see, uh, this is an example of immunization with mock peptide. Uh, we see the onset, which is similar to this clinically, uh, maybe to the beginning of the clinically isolated syndrome, together with the peak of the disease, and then this remission or going over into the chronic phase here at, uh, the, uh, at a later time points. Of course, there are also models where uh, we can see also this relapsing remitting um, uh, course, and uh, all these models uh, will be used. 
Why I'm referring to this is the fact uh, that we won't be able to uh, perform intravital imaging in, uh, at a subcellular or subcellular resolution in a human. And this is why, from my point of view, this kind of models are really important, and not only for me, but really they are generally uh, used in order to understand the, uh, the pathogenesis. Now, as a biophysicist, I need to question myself which are the available tools to understand the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis. And uh, yesterday, uh, I thought uh, a bit, what do we need actually to understand um, this pathophysiology and pathogenesis? And I thought, well, it, uh, we need to understand everything, uh, the disease, at, of course, at a molecular level. And there are many of you that are using a lot, I haven't enumerated all, a lot uh, of techniques to understand what's happening genetically, what's happening maybe at the protein level, why, and why is this good? It's, it gives us a lot of information connected somehow with the function or dysfunction of the organ, of the tissue, or, and actually of the organisms leading actually to the problems, but it's only an indirect connection because we are not observing the function, we are just observing the molecules that are supposed to do this function. And there is still a poor relation to the tissue context. Of course, uh, we have the, the opportunity, and our institute is quite uh, very good in it, to observe everything at the cellular level, where the methods are high throughput level, uh, method approaches, but also with um, only limited um, uh, access to the tissue context, as uh, we know. And the, prob uh, the problem here is that we don't know anything about the uh, communications between the cells. But we know something about most of the cells from the tissues. And now we are coming further to uh, the organ and tissue level, where we have heard actually about MRI, and there are, I think, a lot uh, of techniques that allow us really to understand the spatial temporal context of the disease. The problem is uh, that the resolution, at least the special resolution, is still limited. I remember MRI, uh, for MRI I've heard something like 50 to 100 cells is the resolution that can be reached. Maybe I'm not, uh, I didn't uh, check it so quite completely, but... Yeah. So in a routine MRI you will have a resolution of one millimeter? Yes. But then for, <coughs> for the best that you can best, guess. 70, and if you have really long uh, scanning times, then you would go down to 150 microns. But that's it. But, and this would be, when I'm calculating with 15 micrometer per cell, that would be 10 cells, which is yeah. really, really good. But still, it's not the cellular resolution that we would like to have to understand what's happening at the cellular level, and maybe to have the chance to go within these cells, within this context, down to the molecular level. Um, what's in between the cellular level and uh, the tissue level is the histology that we are using, and it's also used in diagnosis and also in the clinics, which uh, gives us uh, an idea about a special context, but because it's dead, it, uh, it doesn't uh, give us any information about uh, the time course. And in order to fill this gap, actually, to have an idea about uh, the spatial uh, temporal context, but at a cellular uh, level and maybe also at a molecular level, we need another technology. And this is the place where the intravital microscopy is coming. Now, which kind of images are we seeing? Not only in the, in the inflamed uh, brain, but we can image actually at different positions. Uh, Starting, uh, I is just um, what we see is actually um, the movement of the cells and also communication between the cells. If we have the uh, the opportunity to um, label different 
uh, cell subsets. Here in red is, uh, are actually immune cells uh, labeled by tandem RFP, and in green you see the processes of uh, neurons in the brainstem of, um, not a rat, how it's shown here, but uh, of a mouse. Now, um, the idea is that therefore, and I need to bother you with a bit of physics uh, in this context, what uh, do we need in order to perform, to obtain these images, is actually a two-photon laser scanning microscope, which different uh, from the microscopes that you are typically use, uh, using, these confocal microscopes, I'm referring to the fluorescence mi uh, microscopes, it's not uh, in which the molecules are not excited only with one photon, this is the typical one photon excitation that many of you are using, but you need actually two photons at the same time of half of the energy. Why is, uh, are we doing something which a physicist would say it's crazy because it's very, very improbable, is the fact that uh, um, actually we, the light that we use here would be laser light in the uh, range of near-infrared and infrared, which makes actually uh, the excitation and also the photo bleaching and photo destruction outside the focus really neglectable so that you wouldn't have any kind of photo damage outside uh, the uh, focal plane. It will penetrate into tissue much deeper than uh, it happens actually with visible light. If you are holding the hand against the light, against the sun, the, uh, uh, you will see actually red light going through and infrared light going uh, much better through. So we are getting deeper into uh, the tissue, and um, biological tissue, into our tissue. And because we are exciting only at the focal plane, we don't need a pinhole like in a confocal microscope, but we will have a natural and intrinsic optical sectioning which makes uh, our pictures and all these movies quite crisp and let us understand what's hap uh, happening deep inside uh, the organs. And this makes it so interesting for deep tissue uh, in vivo imaging. Now, to um, put together what are the pros and what are the contrasts for this in vivo imaging, in general, uh, it preserves, of course, uh, the tissue context we can access uh, information about the cellular dynamics and about the cellular communications. Not that at the moment when we killed the mouse, we see that the two cells are just next to each other, but we see how this communication is taking place. We have subcellular resolution, but we are limited only at a small region of the whole, which uh, makes actually a minus um, a contract for this technology as compared, for instance, to the fax, where we can look at millions of cells quite easily. It, we still, the conventional intravital imaging is still limiting, uh, limited um, at a few hours so that we cannot look at a time course of a whole disease, which is quite important, especially for multiple sclerosis. And uh, we are limited, uh, it's limited to uh, as far as the cellular and tissue function is concerned. We cannot apply it in humans normally because we need also fluorescence labeling and except for the blood vessels, I haven't heard yet that we were allowed to uh, get humans that are fluorescent uh, transgenic actually and this limits us completely so we are limited to uh, mice. Which kind of information can we get out of it? We can uh, get information uh, from the conventional uh, imaging. We can get information about how the cells are moving. Here are some trajectories of these immune cells infiltrating the brain. And to differentiate between, for instance, all immune cells, here in CD45, or mock specific T cells, which are supposed to be the bad one in, uh, in EIE, and we can look at them at different, um, in different mice, at different uh, stages of the disease, and we can tell, okay, they are moving uh, slower or faster, and 
they might have longer contacts or shorter contacts with the neurons because just pumping into, uh, if uh, an immune cell is pumping into a neuron doesn't mean that it kills it. But maybe it takes a longer time, a longer contact, that we cannot get this information, we cannot get in a different uh, way in order to kill that neuron. What's happening with the neuron after uh, uh, such an immune cell is contact, uh, contacting it? Is it just disrupting the axon or what's happening within uh, the neuron? We don't know this yet, but what we know is, okay, the contacts might be longer or might be strong, uh, shorter, and this we can differentiate between uh, in this way, uh, we can differentiate whether different types of, uh, for here, different T cells uh, of different specificity or of different origin, they uh, are acting differently on um, the axons and on the neurons. Well, this is not enough because this is not, still not telling us if uh, the neurons uh, are really uh, damaged or and are really dying and this is what we want to look at and this is why we started to improve uh, our uh, technology and went on in trying to uh, to do functional in vivo imaging we looked at neuronal calcium and also at the metabolisms of, of all cells looking at the metabolism uh, just came uh, <laughs> It means that we are looking at endogenous uh, coenzymes, NADH and NADPH, which solves partially also the problem that we can uh, we need a fluorescence labeling because NADH and NADPH is actually all over the place and in all uh, cells. Now coming back to the neuronal uh, calcium, how can we measure this? For, in order to uh, image neuronal calcium, we need actually a transgenic. Uh, a transgenic mouse in vivo, and this is the certain L15 mouse, which contains in the neuron a uh, calcium-sensitive uh, protein, this is the troponin C, which changes its conformation from an elongated conformation to uh, a uh, folded conformation upon uh, calcium um, addition. What uh, we, uh, what's special about uh, this troponin C is that it has a FRET pair, a uh, um, CFP uh, cyan fluorescent protein and a yellow fluorescent protein on it, which uh, will be excited. First of all, this one, only this one, only the um, cyan fluorescent, CFP cyan fluorescent protein uh, in the microscope. And if there is low calcium in this elongated form, there would be no crosstalk between these two uh, molecules, and we will see only cyan fluorescence, uh, fr uh, fluorescence out of it. If uh, uh, the troponin C is folded, like in uh, this case, there is something um, happening on the molecular uh, side that the whole energy that I'm pumping in with the laser and the uh, uh, CFP is going over to the uh, yellow fluorescent protein and I'm starting to see yellow fluorescence. This is the process, um, this is the first resonant energy transfer that some of you have heard of, but I thought it's not bad to um, really uh, repeat uh, the principle. We are using exactly this principle uh, in these mice, this uh, and C actually in neurons, can connect uh, in neurons, uh, the FRET ratio exactly this transfer uh, uh, with uh, the concentration of calcium, as, as you can see here. And the good part uh, with this calcium sensor is that um, we can identify really good at which step uh, the uh, calcium concentration in neurons is reaching one micromolar here it's in the middle of this titration curve, as uh, you can see, because at this concentration, the neurobiologists are saying that uh, uh, the uh, neurons reach a, con a calcium concentration which leads irreversibly to neuronal death. And this is why this is actually uh, the threshold for uh, neuronal damage. 
Is it helping us uh, in the context of EIE? Yes, because what we can, uh, what we have observed, and this is just an example, is then when a T cell, this is, was uh, a mock specific T cell, is really touching and having a longer contact with, um, uh, in this case, a somata, at this site, the calcium concentration increases over uh, a value of one uh, micromolar. And this happens, this is just an example, but this happens over and over again. Now, what have we uh, used too is the fluorescence of um, uh, the endogenous fluorescence uh, of the coenzymes NADH, NADPH, because they are just the very basis of metabolism in general. So all, all the cells need this just to survive. The beautiful part of it is that they are fluorescing and their fluorescence lifetime in the free state, in dying or resting cells, is very, very short. But when bound to an enzyme, and this, if NADH or NADPH are binding to an enzyme, it means that they are participating to some vital process within the cell. Then the fluorescence lifetime increases dramatically, four or five times. And moreover, their fluorescence, the fluorescence lifetime of NADH and NADPH strongly depends on the binding site of, uh, on the enzyme that it is binding to. And here you can see the different fluorescence lifetimes of NADH and NADPH bound to seven different enzymes that you, uh, you will find in the mitochondria. And the more beautiful part uh, about is, it is that if NADPH is binding to uh, the NADPH oxidase family, no matter in which cells, even in plant cells, the fluorescence lifetime increases even more dramatically as compared to these basic survival um, enzymes at all the time uh, around a, a value of 3,600 picoseconds. Why is this uh, family of NADPH oxidase is so important? They are responsible for massive reactive oxygen species um, production for the oxidative burst, but in the EIE it's not an oxidative burst, as I will tell you in one moment. Now, what, uh, and we have, uh, we could check this, first of all, in cell culture to make sure that we haven't uh, done anything uh, wrong. We looked at the NOx uh, enzymes activation. What's the difference to what you all know? We can look uh, if NADPH oxidase is present within some cells, but if the molecules is really active, and when it is active, you cannot look with typical uh, molecular biological methods. And what we have seen in these astrocytes that is that astrocytes just surviving, uh, which are unstimulated, uh, activate actually uh, enzymes around uh, 1,400 and uh, 2,000 uh, picoseconds. This is the fluorescence lifetime of NADH and NADPH. But if we are adding some phagocytosis beads, Staphylococcus speeds, or the chemical weapon, uh, PMA, an additional peak <coughs> appears, which is typical for the NADPH oxidase. Why should we be uh, interested in it in EAE? In uh, EIE and also in MS, it has been shown uh, not only but also by the group of Professor Lassmann from Vienna that actually the massive RS production and also by the group of, uh, of Professor Kirschensteiner and Miskel uh, that uh, the massive RX uh, production is a very, very uh, um, important factor in uh, neuronal damage, even in early neuronal damage, and uh, that this is also connected in MS patient or, uh, patient's brain with a higher expression of NADPH oxidase. And this is what we have seen too, that in healthy controls we don't see much of an ROS, but at the lesion sites we see a lot of ROS production. ROS is, stays for reactive oxygen species. I, I hope I have said this uh, before. Now, ROS is a very small molecule. I don't know where is it coming from because, uh, uh, because 
it diffuses very fast and further reacts in some avalanche reactions. So if somebody would help, uh, ask me which cells are producing ROS, I think it's quite difficult to say. We can say which cells are uh, expressing NADPH oxidase, but if they were um, the one that really produced it, it's still questionable. And uh, the uh, very important part is uh, that Many cells are expressing NADPH oxidase, including neurons. Are they neurons killing themselves in MS? I think this is quite a crazy theory, I'm clinician would say. What everybody would believe is that phagocytes, macrophages, infiltrating uh, the brain from the meninges or uh, through the leakages in the um, blood brain uh, barrier, are producing uh, actually the reactive oxygen species. Here you can uh, see some phagosomes. We looked at lice M cells, uh, TDRP cells, just to identify them. Um, and then we thought, well, this is a good idea, but first of all, let's look. Uh, do, you, do we see activated NADPH oxidase? actually in the brain of um, uh, this uh, mice at different stages of EIE. And we saw act, uh, that in the uh, normal healthy brain, we see only the survival basic uh, enzymes, but at later stages we see actually an, um, this uh, clear activation of uh, NADPH oxidase taking over from these basic survi uh, survival enzymes. And this seems to be more in the peak EIE than in the onset EIE. Moreover, we were able to correlate this even in one and the same mouse with an increase uh, in uh, cal neuronal calcium and uh, we have seen that we need actually a threshold of an activation area of uh, around two, and then this um, uh, the dependence between the NOx activation area and the neuronal dysfunction area is almost perfectly linear. And this is truly increasing in a peak as compared to the onset. Now, uh, of course, we have seen that this really comes uh, partially from the less and positive cells and not from the neurons. As you can see here in neurons, we don't see any red spots indicative for the activation of NADPH oxidase, but, uh, in the, uh, but actually in uh, the less and positive cells. But we looked the other way around. From the total activation area uh, that we see in tissue, no matter uh, which cells we are looking at, both in onset and in peak, the contribution of lice and positive cells was limited. What's the rest? The rest are cells that are belonging to, uh, typically belonging to the brain, partially microbial and of course activated um, uh, also macrophages in the 6-3-CO1 mouse, no T cells, well, this is what we expected somehow, but a large contribution came from the astrocytes. And very interestingly, even after the mice recovered, and they felt quite good, they got to a score of zero, there were no immune cells in the brain, we still saw overactivation of NADPH oxidase. And this still correlated locally with uh, neuronal calcium indicating neuronal damage. And it was in the same manner a linear, um, uh, oh, a linear uh, dependency. And we looked also at their cellular origin and we saw this came a, uh, a lot from uh, astrocytes and in this case from microglia because they were uh, CD45, in fact, experience they were CD45 low at least. And moreover, because also human cells uh, contain NADH and NADPH, we were able at least to look in the blood of MS patients at different uh, stages uh, of the disease with and without treatment, actually together with Friedemann. 
and uh, we looked at CD11 B cells and saw a similar um, fingerprint uh, as a, uh, in the brain, at brainstem of the mouse, and also as in the uh, splenic CD11 B cells uh, in the mouse, also in humans. <coughs> we see actually a, a high uh, NOx activation area in uh, untreated pati uh, patients at the peak of the disease, but which could be actually treated both with glutamyl acetate and also with the addition of an antioxidant, but which could not be recovered in SPMS patients, no matter of the treatment, which treatment it was applied. And this is why we are convinced that we are, we are dealing here with a kind of oxidative stress memory, which is systemic, both systemic and in the target organ, and coming back to the glutamate, this is why I was very happy about it. Um, we think that because a lot of this overactivation is coming from the astrocytes and from the cells that are supposed actually to uh, take care of the neurons and not to kill them, that there is a shift maybe in their um, uh, function that we really and and not necessarily in their morphology. And what, and we are asking uh, now what is inducing this shift. And what we have noticed is that if we are just adding glutamate to the brain of a healthy mouse, we will see an increase of NADPH oxidase because what we have also uh, seen is that um, actually auto -anti uh, the antibodies against NMDA receptor, which counterpart is the glutamate, is uh, really inducing NOx activation. The theory in epilepsy is that it happens in neurons, but also astrocytes and microglia have this receptor, and this, is, uh, this might, might be an explanation why uh, they are getting crazy, uh, they are getting enough, uh, enough autoantibodies. If this is coming from plasma cells or not, it's still open, and I think this is something that we can uh, discuss. Now we have improved this functional imaging and this helped us a lot to better understand what's happening uh, in there. What we have also improved uh, is really to perform longitudinal uh, imaging in the retina. I will get through it because the time is limited uh, quite uh, short. We developed uh, a way to non-invasively but longitudinally image the CNF through the retina, and this fits very good also uh, the clinics because optical coherence tomogra tomography is used as a differential for differential diagnosis as partially, or it started to be used, uh, and actually the idea to access the uh, the brain through the eye is a very appealing idea. We didn't look uh, in EIE, but in another uh, model for the autoimmunity in the eye, this is the EAU, and we're able actually to monitor what immune cells are really doing. These are uh, microglia and acti uh, activated microglia and macrophages at different time points during the course of the uh, disease, and we were, what we were able to look at is to monitor different cell types, of course T cells, uh, but also phagocytes, and to, uh, we are able to, moni uh, to monitor how uh, is their movement in one and the same individual, and then to correlate this in the same certain mice uh, with a possible um, neuronal damage. In this case, <coughs> there was no neuronal, although we had a lot of immune infertility, and the cells were moving quite uh, good, we didn't see any kind of neuronal damage, which makes uh, the model inadequate to uh, be compared to MS, where uh, neurodegeneration in the eye is observed. And with this, I'm finishing my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention and to the cooperation partners. <laughs>